And now we move on to our region number four, North America, represented by Terry Ivers. Good afternoon. Is this on? Yeah. Well, there's really not much more for me to say. Um, my name is Terry Ivers, and uh, I joined the company 18 months ago. Uh, the company decided to, as Tom said, uh, to have four divisions, uh, operative divisions. Uh, I came into the organization finding uh, a bit of a uh, holding company mentality in the U.S., uh, watching over the four companies. My job was to build a division. That's important because the company wanted to have someone on the ground, wanted to have a team on the ground to watch our important projects and the client relationships, not flying over, flying back, but being there. That's good for me because I'm born and raised in Houston. That's my town. Uh, I'm a Texan. I'm very proud of that. And uh, that's also important for Billfinger. You laugh, but uh, it is very important. Uh, the most of the key CapEx decisions made in the US and perhaps in the world, one single place, it's Houston, Texas. And so to be there and to be, uh, have a relationship with the majority of the customers in town, to be able to go over and knock on the door, talk about opportunities where we can bring value is very important. My charge with Billfinger is actually to raise awareness of who we are. We are known in Germany, but the Billfinger name is not common knowledge uh, in the United States and in North America. That's the reality of things. We are known by the legal entities that we've been operating in. There is some awareness of Billfinger, but what an exciting opportunity. As Tom says, we have been stabilizing and building up during this period of time and checking a lot of boxes. But as I launch and as we launch the Billfinger name, and we're being very careful with that, we're going to do it with Franz. We're going to do it on digitalization, with Tobias on biopharma, with Michael on all the products that we're producing in Europe, and we're going to launch those in the U.S. And we're going to build up our uh, revenue and our EBIT based upon that new, new uh, delivery to the market. But today, we are primarily serving the chemical and, and petrochemical market, uh, the oil and, and gas market. The others, that's a large others because our legacy businesses, we do serve the federal government. We also serve uh, the consumer products industry. And that is where, earlier was mentioned by uh, Gerald, that uh, our longest uh, serving customer and client with the company is Procter & Gamble. And that is now 73 years in that journey with them and we're very proud of that relationship. Most of our projects are lump sum uh, today, um, but that trend is changing. I'm gonna talk about that a bit. The, um, the market is, 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 is buoyant at the moment. It's creating different conversations. Uh, it's been mentioned a couple of times about our Lindy Brascam project. We'll close on that in this slideshow, but that's a unit rate project. And we're also having uh, conversations with clients regarding large reimbursable construction contracts. My colleague Ali mentioned uh, the outstanding weld rejection rates in the Middle East. However, I do believe, I believe we've got some better numbers uh, that we have in the U.S., and our client has been contacting us about that as well. So. Um, uh, one key message on this slide um, I want you guys to, to focus on is predictable, sustainable, repeatable. Now we have a number of mottos and mission statements with this company, but the one that I've added in North America is predictable, sustainable, repeatable. To our clients, to our investors, for our employees, that's key. We don't want any surprises. No surprises, Klaus. So uh, <laughs> that's the commitment. Boy, we have an exciting market in North America. Very exciting. I know you're hearing about it all the time. Um, uh, the um, consumer confidence is high. Hey, we all are buying stuff. We're very excited. We believe in the future. So we're going out and buying stuff. We're driving a lot. So we're using a lot of oil and gas. Um, the unemployment rate is way down um, and now. Uh, in the areas that we're operating, primarily Texas, Louisiana, in the south, other locations, in those industries, personnel are very, very scarce. That creates an opportunity for us because uh, we have a reputation as a favored employer. 
Our clients see us as being able to provide supervision and craft labor, and so they come to us. So in a tight market, that's good for us. Um, the regulatory environment is favorable. The tax environment, as you're hearing, is favorable. Um, that creates for developers a confidence to invest in projects and build those out and then look for partners, construction partners, that can help them with those. I mentioned another important uh, number is uh, production of oil and gas. Uh, we are now in the U.S. at 10.2 million barrels per day. The projections by the U.S. government are that we'll be at 10.7 uh, on the average for 2018. Uh, Russia 10.5, Saudi Arabia 10.2. Uh, we could have a chance this year to eclipse them as an oil producer. What's driving all that? Again, back to the Texas base. We're producing 4.2 million barrels of oil per day as compared to 3.3 million barrels of oil per day last year. What, uh, why that's important is in Texas, we also have a supporting transmission grid, transmitting oil and gas, a pipeline infrastructure. It's not just about production. You gotta get it to where you can manufacture it and turn it in and monetize it, turn it into something more valuable. In our case, that is petroleum and chemicals on the U.S. Gulf Coast in Texas and Louisiana. Now, we actually have a bit of a bottleneck in Texas right now uh, in our gas pipelines. The associated oil that is coming out, associated gas that is coming out with the oil in West Texas uh, has no place to go. And there are limitations on flaring in Texas, believe it or not. There are limitations on flaring. We do think about the environment. And so, um, so the pipeline infrastructure has to be built out a bit. That's an opportunity again for us and what we do in cryogenic plants and metering stations and compression stations and pumping stations. So every issue in terms of a challenge creates an opportunity and the very nature of the production creates an opportunity at the same time uh, for us. So uh, uh, very exciting times. Um, there is a concern, the US federal government has a concern about, uh, the Fed has a concern about an overheated market so, but we, so we could see some uh, uh, interest increases this year. That will play a factor uh, going forward. Uh, just a slide, a lot of numbers here really focus on the fact that we saw a change uh, of 11.1% growth from 16 to 17 on CapEx expenditures, and now we're projecting another 16% for 18. I want to focus on petrochemical, uh, which is a very important market for us. The gas that we have uh, in the U.S. and in Texas, uh, we're creating ethane with that as a feedstock for chemicals and plastics. That gives us a, an advantage in the global market. Others don't have the opportunity to have that gas and therefore derive ethane. They use naphtha. They're, they're deriving that from oil. Oil is more expensive. Uh, gas has separated from oil So uh, in terms of pricing. It's very economical. So in Texas, at using ethane, or in the Gulf Coast, using ethane as a feedstock is creating wonderful opportunities for expansions along the Gulf Coast. And we're involved in a number of those, as Tom was mentioning, with uh, the uh, methanol facility and other projects such as the Lindy Braskem polypropylene facility. So uh, ethane's an advantage, but for those producers that are not producing plastics or chemicals, but are involved in chloroalkali or caustic facilities and others, they're benefiting from the low cost natural gas from an electricity uh, uh, requirement where uh, huge demand for electricity, they're benefiting from that. So both the, the power and the energy need as well as the feedstock is creating an environment in the US that is very robust. We're here at a good time in the U.S. and in North America. Now, the projections long-term, Moody's, for example, is seeing that this is not a temporary uh, situation. This is a, a decades-long trend. Uh, I would say that some of us, and I want to put my environmental hat back on for a moment, uh, we're concerned about plastic, single-use plastics in the world. That's not a good thing. We at Bill Finger would not support that as well as a long-term. But even if we can find a way of eliminating those single-use plastics, that's only going to have a 3 to 4% impact on the overall plastic market and a, a, a minor impact on the demand for oil. So this is a long-term trend, and so we see plenty of uh, many, many years of opportunity in Texas as we go forward. Now, um, 
I'm going to focus a little bit on our heavy construction business, Westcon. We were a, um, a cold weather contractor located in the north, working in the Balkan, not a lot of competitors, always were successful, very successful. Um, the future, however, is taking that business uh, and not only concentrating in the north and the east, but bringing it to the south, an environment that has many more competitors. Contracting is much more challenging. Uh, contracts are, uh, and, and the legal experts around those are much more astute. So we have to have all of our processes, our procedures, our estimating departments, our project controls department running at 100% at, at efficiency effectiveness to ensure that we can deliver the project we expect. Now, um, we had to analyze our departments. We had to review those. We analyzed all the lessons learned from all of our projects, good and bad. Not, not just resting on the fact that we can repeat great projects that were in another region in the U.S. and bring those to the South with the same success. No, stepping back and analyzing, and we've done all that. One of the things that we've really focused on is um, uh, the, the identification of risks on our projects and in the contracts that we sign. Very key. The executive board challenged me and said, Terry, seriously, before you come here and ask for the approval of large projects, you're going to have to demonstrate to me that you and your team can look at these projects, identify the risks, assess them, and mitigate them. And we've done that. We have uh, 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 created uh, our quantitative and qualitative risk uh, uh, programs. Uh, in this case, I'm just showing a slide, which is we're, we're, we're leveraging Oracle Primavera, our, our, our scheduling tool, fully loaded, cost loaded, uh, with our experts. We will run 2,000 iterations of every project looking for that ideal point where we can say, now we can execute it, we know what our risks are at this point, we can put the proper contingency at those risks, and then we can book the project, get approval from the board, and proceed. Now, in doing that, we bring our experts into a room, uh, we interview them, we have a facilitation, we interview those experts, we get their feedback into the program, which, is, which we're analyzing. We also bring Cold Eyes Review in, Folks that are not involved in building that project, but are experts in the industry. We bring them in to get their perspective just in case we uh, may have missed something. So uh, this, this has given us a great deal of confidence and has also given us approval from the board. We're not going to be able to approve these or, or proceed to contract to these large jobs without demonstrating that to our, our board. Again, uh, repeatable, sustainable, predictable results. That is our objective. Now. The, the project that we're are talking about here, this is the Lindy Braskem polypropylene project. Lindy is a longtime customer of ours. We've had them for many, many years and had each project that we've had in North America has been successful. Um, this, uh, uh, this one is at Braskem. It's only about two and a half, three miles from our southern region headquarters for Westcon in Deer Park, Texas. Uh, what's different about this job? Uh, we have a challenging contract. It is a unit rate contract. But we have a contracts manager on board. Uh, the contracts manager is there to help us and educate all of our members on the, uh, the, the project management team as to what the contract is, what does it say, uh, any change orders or any change that occurs. We understand how to document that change and communicate that quickly to our clients so that we, together with them, can make decisions about a path forward. No surprises. The client sees that in, in, as an advantage. As we're in the project, as we do see change, we are going to rerun our analysis, our quantitative risk assessment, to ensure that that change is not changing our ability to predict the outcome of that project. And we'll also share those results with our clients so that that relationship of trust uh, will continue to grow. Uh, 20 to 30 percent of each of our projects, on average, is, is involving subcontractors. So therefore, subcontractors play a key role in our success. We have a subcontracts manager on board, and not as in the past relying on superintendents and others in their relationships to manage those subs by themselves. But we also involve superintendents who are familiar with those particular subs, and they already have a relationship, so there's no surprise in that relationship. Now, underpinning all of this, and this was said earlier by the other speakers, uh, quality and safety. We don't get any contracts in North America unless we can demonstrate to our client that we're operating safely. 
Our pledge to our employees is to return them home every day in the same condition that they came to work. That's a pledge, that's a commitment, and we're looking beyond the success we've had so far. We're giving our employees stop work cards where they can, if they're confused on a project or they're getting conflicting instructions, they can raise their card, stop work, come down from the job, talk to their supervisor, and then go back to work. Uh, we're also looking at predictive analysis uh, uh, algorithms and others predicting high-risk areas in our projects so we can intervene before something happens. Um, let me leave you with this. Uh, we will have other projects like this. Uh, I'm certain that the board is anxious for me to present those. Uh, we will be coming back here again soon um, because we're going to continue to deliver predictable, sustainable, sustainable results. Thank you very much.